If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, for the first 15 minutes, we do our typical intro. Why did you say 15? Doug wrote 16. My bad. 16. Was it 16? Is that said, 6 or 5? Oh, wow. Is your site going oh like that? Oh, my God. It where, says 16 minutes. Where am I? Wow. Uh, Look at him squinting, <laughs> Justin. Do you see him squinting right now to do that? I cannot see them all. Uh, Justin, I know, has got the bad side, but you really bad. I dude. do, man. I'm the one wearing the glasses you know, in the group. You know what sucks, too? I had you laser, can borrow mine, I had dude. laser eye surgery a while ago, too. <laughs> oh, you better get your uh, money back. It was a long time ago. <laughs> that was a bad laser. It was a bad yeah, laser. Yeah, yeah very good. So good we laser. start off by talking about our- <laughs> Doug just blew up the letters for you, it looks like. Our favorite- <laughs> We talk about our favorite interviews in the past 30 days. Man, it's been going like fire. We talk about Doe-Eyed Drew. Doe-Eyed Drew. Doe-Eyed Drew. And Taylor. We gave some love to Taylor. And yeah. Justin's and T-Dog too. Run, run and gun yeah. at the Spartan interviews. And then we, we also mentioned uh, Shauna, who's our representative from Organifi, who we absolutely loved. She, uh, you know, Drew Cannoli, if you're listening right now. She represents your brand very, very well. We're yeah. thinking about getting engaged with you guys. We're on the fence right now. We're kind of courting we're, right yeah, now. We're we courting, like you. We're flirting. Yeah. All that. I fun see stuff. what you did. You sent your uh, one of your superstar Shauna over to meet us and mm-hmm. kind of win us over, and then you throw over a contract to lock us in for the rest of our lives. <laughs> I see you guys. I see what you're doing. We like what you're doing. Well, we, and we she, like your style. But you yeah. know what's cool? She brought the because we all. I, no, nobody remember to bring their green juice, which was I was like, "Fuck!" We're gonna oh, I know we were screwed. Right. We're gonna need us. this because we were going so hard. But Shauna delivered, hooked yeah. it up, gave us the green juice, and I got to give. We it, had it all weekend. I got to give it to Drew for his first time ever, and he loved it. Little doe eyed Drew, a little nineteen year old. So those like, of you, energized. Those of you that stay on top of all of our YouTube channel, you can see how much Organifi green juice affects editing skills. Yeah, yeah watch. it's so a lot better. Take a look at it what we have coming up fire. on YouTube. By the way, if you want to get Organifi products, go to OrganifiShop.com, enter the code MindPump, and you'll get a fat, massive, big discount. Whoa. Then we get into the questions. The first question was, is there an optimal length of time to do a cut without losing muscle? And would a slower cut be better for your metabolism than a faster Find one? Find out if the answer is 172 hours. No cuts, no butts, no coconuts. The next question was, is it true that you need to warm up the body with cardio before lifting? Uh, the answer is no. Should we be aimless or purposeful? And yes. Do you know how to golf? The next question was, what are our thoughts on low calorie, quote unquote, healthy foods like Halo Top and how they affect a person's relationship with food? For example, Justin. Find ate, out how much ice cream I used to eat every single day. And Justin mm-hmm. ate like 15 meat bars I the did. other day. Yeah, I like them meat bars. But they're healthy. <laughs> <laughs> finally, finally, the last question Is there anything we miss about personal training? Uh, me and Justin miss it. Adam hated it. <laughs> he talks about Adam it. Adam just dumped everybody. It was like, peace. He talks about it in this uh, in this episode. And finally, because we do mention MAPS Prime in this episode, I want to mention we have something called the MAPS Prime Bundle. Now, what we've done is we've taken MAPS Prime, which is uh, a program that assesses you and teaches you how to program what to do before your workouts. This is super important, by the way. I, I, want, to, I want to be clear here. What you do before your workouts really sets the stage for how effective what you do in your workout is. If you squat, deadlift, bench press, overhead press, whatever, and you don't prime your body properly, you could be sending the wrong signals. You could be creating bad recruitment patterns, or you could be just not building as much muscle as you could or burning as much fat. MAPS Prime teaches you that, but we also have MAPS Prime Pro, which is a totally different program, which is fully... Uh, correctional. Mm -hmm. With MAPS Prime Pro, it helps you assess your body, identify pain, identify areas of significance. Discomfort. Discomfort. And then you correct them with correctional exercises. That program was designed with the well-known and prestigious uh, movement, mobility, brilliant specialist. Guru. uh, Dr. Justin Brink. He actually helped us create that. So we've taken both programs, put them together. Shout out to Dr. Brink. At a massive discount. You can find the Prime and Prime Pro bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. And by the way, that bundle is for anybody, regardless of your workout. So I don't care if you do CrossFit, bodybuilding, marathon running, whatever. 
that bundle crazy shit you're doing. Get them together and you get a discounted rate. That bundle will help you out. Again, it's at mindpumpmedia.com. Dude, you know what would be the best is if somebody finally came out with like an American gladiator course, right? And they were like, Trying to throw shit at you, and you know you had to like yeah. run through them, and like See, to yeah. me, so you want one be amazing. You want one with real danger, like to yeah. Me, yeah. To me, American Gladiator needs to be reborn because that whole dude, I, I loved that show. So did people, I. People get jacked. Who didn't who didn't love American Gladiator? I loved that show. You always had these like yeah. roided out body nitro. Bodies. They were yeah, they were the yeah. dude. Yes. <laughs> what about yeah. the women? Hercules. Remember the women? Like I yeah. feel like if they were, and remember Joe was it Joe DiStefano was telling us back in the days how they had to have the gladiators, the yeah, he would Martin. jack them at the end. I love finishes. that. I love that idea. <laughs> you know what I saw once that I thought punch was, somebody that I thought was brilliant. This was, and I think it was around Halloween. It might even be happening now. Is they have these races where they're like scary, and you're running through obstacles and shit, and then there's people that have like crazy makeup on to look like zombies and monsters and shit oh. and they fucking chase you down in this scary situation now you're adrenaline running <laughs> yeah dude yeah, 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 think yeah. about how fun that would yeah. be you know like, what i'm saying because you know it's fake like just... loud dogs on chains just yeah. i think it would be cool just to have like a uh like a backpack version of remember the gun they used to have that shot the tennis balls yeah, yeah. and you could be on the on the track on the trail you know yeah. like in hidden in places you come around paintball. you come around the corner on like, I was going, <laughs> like tennis oh, ball tennis ball just pelts you in the side <laughs> of the head while you're running everybody's wearing helmets through this whole thing <laughs> right I think yeah. it'd be awesome Duh. that would take it now yeah. now, let's, now let's go extreme extreme you know cool, what I mean cool super to, extreme super cool to me. duper extreme yeah you may die yeah most people die. Hey, yeah. you were uh, you were getting interviewed this morning. What was the podcast? What was Paleo going on? OMG? Oh yeah, with OMG. Julie Bauer. Mm-hmm. Uh, how would you think? Oh, uh, great. She, you know her style is um, she's pretty. She can be raw on her show. What I like. Sw- did she swear when she? Wow. On her show. Yeah, she, she did, does. She, did that's, she when she interviewed? Great. Um, no, because I did most of the talking. <laughs> right. Which is kind of weird. <laughs> which kind of happens. Kinda, yeah. um, but uh, no, I cussed a couple times on the show. Who were, okay, so we, I mean, I can't even count how many interviews we've done this last 30 days. What are some of your guys' top two or so that you would say? Like, Ooh, Dr. Really, Andy Galpin. Wow, you said that fast. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Wow. That we interviewed. Either oh, that yeah. we interviewed. Oh, yeah. either or. or. Oh, okay. Interviewed us. us. Interviewed mm. us. Or that. Well, either one. What yeah. are some of your favorite like interviews? All Dalpin is great. He was good. Um, I thought Josh Trent from yeah. Wellness Force did a. He great, does a great job. He did a great job. Yeah. And you know, there's uh, not all podcasters have that ability to do that like he does. Mm-hmm. And so I'd say he's probably one of the better interviewers that I've been interviewed by. You know what's interesting is he, uh, we talked about this a lot, like, because I did a podcast with him too, and it was like the free uh, flow form, you know, that we kind of have, like, he picked up on that right away because he used to over plan and he, like, he was interviewing a lot of CEOs and, mm. you know, people that, like, he needed a lot of background on. And so he would do all this, like, planning and structure. And no, man. He just started ripping it out like that and he, he's doing really well. Dude, if you look at the greatest interviewers of all time, they they may plan sure like uh, Barbara Walters or you know Howard Stern, I'm sure they have an idea, but it never comes across scripted and it's always comes across as very conversational. Yeah. So that's what you got to kind of do. Josh Trent does a good job of that. Yeah. But we we had a great episode with yeah. uh, with him up in uh, up, uh, up at the Spartan Race Tahoe. Yeah. Yeah. No. He. I, in my opinion, of all the interviewers and interviewees that we've uh that we've dealt with i think that josh trent is by far he's the most of, talented he's right? one of the most underrated yeah uh considering how good he yeah, and, and the definition of good to me and you guys can interrupt or tell me what you we think, will <laughs> right yeah. uh i think somebody who has this ability to let the conversation just naturally flow like nothing drives me more crazy when people ask like these scripted questions and they're that, too calculated well and they don't flow with the conversation it's yeah. like you asked me about something that's related to like my childhood then all of a sudden you jump over to like carbs yeah right it's like <laughs> whoa it, that's not now i would never communicate with somebody like that in real life like if we we're all just bullshitting having a conversation 
I wouldn't be, uh, we wouldn't be talking about like sports. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I ask you like a business question. Like that just doesn't. It shouldn't feel like an interview. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, when we first started interviewing people, we had that issue where it was like, do I ask these questions? What do I do? Mm-hmm. And then we did our own episodes. They were so great. And we're just like, why don't we just do the same yeah, thing? Why can't we capture this? Yeah. Why don't we people? just do the same thing and just have a conversation? I would be with you, Sal. I really liked the Josh Trent episode a lot. Um, and then who I you know the Ben Greenfield one that was probably one of my favorite uh, that ben, was Ben Greenfield episodes. You know what you know what it, what it was because it was that was very interview like. So it was you yeah. know well he was just reading questions. That's what it was. And Ben knows us. Yeah. So so the way it worked is we did it's actually up it's up right now. Yeah. It's uh-huh. on, yeah. It's on, yeah. On, go on, check on, it out on Ben up. Greenfield's. Yeah. Podcast. So uh, Ben got in the conversation for the first fifteen minutes and then he had to leave. So he had somebody stand in Brock. And he gave Brock uh, a list of questions, but Ben knows us. Yeah. So he asked the like good questions that got us into these nice conversations, mm-hmm. and then the rest was good. How, but it was you, good though. Have you have you listened to it yet? So have you? <laughs> I've listened to half. Did you Did you hear where I totally insulted him with the 1990 business school comment? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that just so happens to be when I went <laughs> accident <laughs> yeah. uh, or on purpose. And then and then Sal right. is a accidental dick. You hear me? <laughs> <laughs> accidental <laughs> dick. <laughs> you I did say that. You did. <laughs> You're even an accident. I don't remember thing. that one. Oh yeah. Uh, well, he was. He made the reference, which I hear all the time. Um, is I don't remember when we first started this. Everybody wants to know who's your niche market. Like who? Give me your avatar. Uh, who's your direct customer? And I hate that. And it to me, it's so business school from 1990. Yeah. Before the the wild wild west of the web. Before dude, you could reach like uh, yes. hundreds of thousands of millions of people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I get it. I understand where that comes. I from. I mean, there's a lot of there's definitely a lot of truth to it. Like, there is. I'll some. give you an example. We go on uh, like podcasts because we know that world, right? You'll get on the podcast. You'll look at the what's new and notable and all that stuff. And a, and a, a nice chunk of them will have in their title something that already niches them like uh pay you know like paleo podcast or keto something or yeah. the crossfit podcast or whatever because and and it gets them attention it gets right you traffic it does because if i'm like a super fanatical you know keto person and i search through podcast the first one's going to pop up is the one with the name of, with the you know keto in the name yeah. the problem is where do you go from there yeah, right. you're gonna talk about keto you all the just, time you forever. Just set your ceiling. You have no like future plans. Like, what are you gonna do? Yeah. yeah, and I think, and personally, a part of that decision was selfish on all of our parts. Like, I don't want to just talk about one topic. No. For, <laughs> you're gonna if you're gonna get ask us to I'll do a, an episode, you know, pretty much every day. You're gonna have to give me more than just fitness to talk about, right. or I'm gonna, as much as I love fitness, like I'll go crazy. All of us, right? So, yeah. I you know that's. There's there's some people that think that's a smart strategy, and I guess if that's it's uh, short versus long term thinking, yeah. you know, because like you could you could make a great business and a little niche business that people know you for that subject, right? You become the expert in that realm, but um, you know, like after that, like you said, it, it, it's going to get capped. Like there, there's nowhere else you can really you know maneuver from there. It's going to be tough. And here's what happens when you attach yourself to a movement that's niche or whatever. If you do a good job of it and you're the best, yes, you'll get this meteoric explosion uh, attached to it. However, at some point, these things always swing back. So, like, if you were, like, when Atkins, remember the Atkins diet when that came out? And it was, like, the big thing because it was low carb, high fat. It was the opposite of what everyone was being told. Yep. Imagine if you had an Atkins podcast at that time. I bet you they You would have blown up, probably. It would have blown up. But then remember, and then, and then when, the, when the popular went down, guess what happens to your audience? And that goes down, too. Yeah. Right. You know, it's not really the best long-term strategy, if you ask me. Yeah, no, I agree. I 100% yeah. agree with that. <laughs> you know who um, I fell in love with over this trip? Hmm. Shauna. No. Oh. Uh, she's awesome though. She's yeah, the she, Organifi. She was great. I yeah. had a good conversation with yeah, her. Yeah, she's our Organifi um, contact. Yeah. And she's an awesome, awesome young lady. Um, and she gave us some more free green juice. Which I was know. Nice. That's why I love her. But you know who I fell in love with? Mm. Drew. 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 Our he, little boy. He's our dude. Our, our, our doe eye Drew. Our doe eye Drew. He's so cute. So we oh, have. I, th- I thought you were going to say, because this was the first time. And, uh, you know, I was telling Katrina this last night. I was really excited to finally get Taylor. To sit down and share his. I already love Taylor. I know. Yeah, yeah. But, we had a great conversation with him. Go ahead, Adam. Yeah. Well, that that's just it. Is like so. I of course because I know Taylor really well, and you know was impressed with him long time ago. 
Um, I knew his whole story, and you guys just, I think, trust my judgment if I say, hey, this is our guy, just trust me. That, and, you know, and we've worked with him for a little while. Right, so I think everybody really loves him and respects him, but for the first time, I think he actually shared his complete story mm -hmm. of how he built his little empire and how much of an authority he was in his in his niche, right? In his mm -hmm. in the in the shoe shoe world, like how he and how he created that for himself, and how talented he really was, man. And so it's pretty cool to uh, I got to watch you guys hear all of that for the first time and get to listen to him because he's not one to talk a lot, right? Mm -hmm. He's not yeah. one to say he's not trying to boast about it, not anything. at all, yeah. not at all his style. And I knew one day would come where. You know, first of all, when I brought him on, it was more like I know that you guys will see through his work how good he is, and that's pretty much like you said how you've gained respect for him already. And then the time would come that there'd be an opportunity for him to share his whole story, mm -hmm. and it was cool to watch you guys get to listen to that for the first time. Really, you know? yeah, he's a um, very hardworking, um, passion-driven artist with what he does, and he's got incredible intuitive abilities for social media and media in general i mean yeah. he's really really good at what he does so it's awesome to have him and then drew is his little brother his little 19 year old brother who is another and i asked him like is this like in your genes his brother very talented also with the uh with like editing and film and stuff like that super passionate little little guy who will sit at his computer and just like a laser beam focus on it yeah and complete these tasks and you know, it was cool watching him hanging out with us because he was so excited about everything. And then he gets so tired. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> he's like everybody's He goes like brother. a million miles an hour and then it's like, where'd Drew go? Oh, he's sleeping he's again. tuckered oh, out. Oh, he's so cute. Yeah. Didn't you guys, yeah. what'd you guys tuckered do? Tuckered out. You guys went to wake him up one Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Dude, uh, you know, it was it was a lot of fun, actually. I, I kind of coined us the run and gun because uh, we just like hijacked the entire Oh, event. it was you and him? Yeah, just, just me and him. And like- I can't wait for that video, by the way. Oh, my God. I can't wait to show you guys um yeah it was like it was madness because he kind of brings that out of me more and he wants me to kind of be a little more ridiculous and stuff and so he's kind of getting more comfortable at um you know coaching and producing me a little bit and yeah. stuff and we kind of riff back and forth of like what about this idea what about this guy this guy's a character let's go get him yeah. you know and it was uh it was just a lot of fun and hopefully that comes out in the video when he cuts it up tell right? everybody what you kind of did to give us kind of a, a, a what, what an idea without spoiling everything what'd you guys do so the the, the plan really was to by the way so the list Listeners know, like Sal and I and Doug, we were doing our own, doing other stuff. We were super busy, and Justin and Drew took off back to the Spartan race where all the competitors have already raced and everything. And it, all it was, the vendors, yeah. everything's over there. Right, and then you guys went over there to shoot some film. So we were just trying to kind of capture a little bit more of the culture of Spartan race. And, you know, because every community has, like, their own, like, little, like, nuanced stuff. Like, they dress a certain way. They have, like, certain vendors they bring into the event. Um, you know, it's just a certain vibe. And uh, so our, our plan was really to try and capture that and, like, you know, have fun with it and, and, and find people that really stood out and ask them, you know, ask them about like what they're wearing, you know, ask them about like their experience running the race. And, um, we found, we found some pretty interesting characters and I, I mean, I'm, I'm running around with like a helmet at some point, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm like interviewing these poor girls, like, like an asshole with this like foam thing on a stick. Like it wasn't even a real mic. <laughs> you know, we just like, we just hijacked it. I'm talking to like legit businesses and everything. And they're like, who are you? Like, what is this? Like, I, it didn't even say anything on it, you know? So it was really like kind of like a rogue, like, let's fucking just go crazy. Was like, it, would you say it was one of your, because you guys have done this now. You did it at Paleo. Yeah. You've done this now here. I think we did it another time too. Is Was this one of your favorite? What do you think? This was like Paleo on steroids. Oh, wow. That yeah, dude, we, we went, we went deep. Oh. So yeah, we I, and it'll get crazier and crazier the more that like I think I feel comfortable to mm -hmm. where I, I can flirt the line where I'll probably get kicked out of one of these events. Oh, that'll at some be point. great. But even if you do, that's a great film. Yeah, you're you are really good when it's when you go off on your own and do that kind of shit for sure. And it just keeps getting better the more you practice it. Like I could not, <laughs> I could not do that like uh, you do. Yeah. I'm I'm trying to, I'm trying to work on it. I feel like this is something that's just fun for me and so it's you know something I can can do, you know. I think at some point we could do it to where like if we could somehow see you and me and Adam can commentate yes. somewhere while yes. you're doing shit. I'll be the guy in the field, you know, like getting all the the athletes and all that engaged. Well, I could see us using the Sling Studio like that. Like how cool would that be? Like where Doug's like controlling like which camera. Oh, we're over here with Justin right now live with Yeah, the, he's uh, out in the field. Yeah. I'm just getting this uh yeah. let's see 
Justin's talking to someone about oh a God. meat bar. If you guys could like tell me what to say in my earpiece Fuck. and all that, and then I'm talking because you people, know we're gonna say some crazy bro, shit. Bro, that would be amazing. Oh I'd my totally God. do it too. Oh, that would be yeah. fun. Oh my God. I have an idea. Look at that. See, yeah. audience Boom. gets to hear ideas how that how this pans out. We gotta do that. And bro. everybody is sober right now. That's pretty good. Perfectly yeah, man. Sober. Nothing. Yeah. Almost. It's, it's almost. Early. Very good. Hundred percent. Um, you guys want to bring the sober bird on? Let's do this. Yeah, let's yeah. go. Wow. being brought to you by Chimera Coffee. It's the only coffee that is infused with all natural nootropics for a cleaner, calmer, and more focused buzz without the crash. Click the Chimera link at mindpumpmedia.com and input the discount code MINDPUMP at checkout for 10% off. It's the motherfucking quad. The eagle has landed. Quee-qua. All right, our first question is from Tracy Cameron 46. Is there an optimal length of time and way to do a cut without losing muscle? And would a slower cut affect your metabolism more than a faster one or vice versa? Okay, so yes, yes, you want yes. you want to cut for uh exactly 72 days Stupid. and I four hours. Yeah, no, like, there's no <laughs> like, where are you going please? here? Where are you going <laughs> yeah, here? Yeah. This is it's so I'm surprised you even picked this question cuz uh, just so the audience knows uh, sometimes it's really hard for us to pick a question when somebody asks very specific things for themselves, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm this, but like people like to put, and remember, like we're trying to help thousands of people. So when someone asks a question that's really, really particular to their goals, it's really tough to give an answer that really benefits everybody. And this one is getting, is flirting with that, that line of, okay, well, you know, is there an optimal length of time and way to cut without, well, no, because everybody is uniquely every this answer is different for every single person when you when you when you go like when you ask a question like that, right? But I think we can generally sure say sure there's taking some, more time is probably better, right? Than going well, super fast. The follow up is would a slower cut affect your metabolism more than a faster? Yeah. And the way, yeah, a slower cut is a much healthier approach towards it. If you here's our thing, our body mm-hmm. is a, an adaptation machine, right? So if you are just not really paying attention, but consistently eat about 2000 calories. Then all of a sudden you decide you're going to go on this cut and you go from 2000 to 1000, which is a big cut, which is a fast, what we consider a fast cut because in the first week you will see yeah, fast results, slow down. fast results. Somebody who cuts a thousand calories every single day in seven days is going to see more results than the person who cut 250 calories every single day. Right. But what ends up happening is within two weeks, that person who's cutting a thousand calories hits a hard wall, yeah. right? And no longer do they start to. And then, again, we're talking about you know arbitrary numbers right now. That could be three weeks for one person, could be ten days for another person. But in general, they're going to hit a wall relatively soon when they do a drastic cut like that. Then they hit that wall, and in other words, their metabolism has now slowed down. It has become, and what what, what happens is the cal- the body becomes efficient mm. at using only those calories and doing the same activity. And if you exceed it just by you know the the, the, the least amount, like your 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 body's going to be affected by it, right? Mm-hmm. Versus somebody, it's the tortoise and the hare, right? Yeah. It's the tortoise and the hare type of deal. And at first, of course, the hare takes off and everybody thinks it's going to win, but it's the slow and steady tortoise that ends up passing up the hare down the way. So from a physical standpoint, uh, slower is better because, like Adam's saying, um, you don't want the body to adapt too quickly to these lower calories. But also, when you take a slower approach, you can also focus on building muscle throughout this process. You know, If I'm just trying to lose weight right now, I'm not going to give myself time to maybe focus on getting stronger and increasing performance or improving performance in the gym, which we know if you get stronger and you focus on building muscle, you will do the opposite of slowing your metabolism down. You'll actually speed it up. And that takes a little longer than just cutting calories. But there's also another uh, component that we're totally missing here with this, which is the psychological component. (laughs) When you're telling someone to lose 30 or 40 pounds, what you're really telling them to do is to have a, a pretty drastic lifestyle change, really. I mean, you're, you're asking someone to lose, you know, a quarter of their body weight or one sixth of their body weight. That's going to require we change. That's an excellent point. We, we got to change quite a bit. And it's very difficult to have any long term lasting changes when you throw 15 changes all at once. You know, if I'm if, if right out the gates, it's like, OK, you're not exercising. You're eating really crappy food. You're going to exercise every day. You're going to eat under these parameters. Here's your specific macros like. 
you you might be very motivated at first, but it might be too much at once, mm. and it may lead to you falling off. Versus doing one step at a time, getting that one step to become a part of your life to where it becomes integrated into your life, and then moving to the next step, and then moving to the next step, and it gives you it gives you room to fall back a little bit and come forward. Because what happens typically when people fall back is they throw it all out. So if I tell someone work out five days a week plus cardio plus do all this you know this stuff with food and they're super motivated, when they throw one of them out, the tendency is to throw all of it out. Like, well, fuck, if I miss the workout, I'm not even going to worry about my food today. Yeah. I'm sure whatever. But if it's one step at a time, then we can play with that step until it becomes integrated. You know what? Integrated. One of the interviews we did this past week, I can't remember who it was, but they asked us a question similar to this, and they actually had a name or a term for something, uh, for the way that we actually coach and teach people. And what that was, was even though your goal is weight loss, the first thing that I do with your diet is actually add to the diet, which seems counterproductive to what you're trying to do. But most people that have got themselves in this situation are underfeeding some some crucial nutrients that their body needs. For example, almost every diet that I ever look at, when I look at a diet, is someone is under consuming fiber, they're over consuming carbohydrates, they're not, not enough vegetables, not enough vegetables, not enough good healthy fats. And so what we do is we normally look at the diet and maybe exchange some of the things that they were, the choices they were making with better, healthier choices and actually more things. So they actually end up getting kind of a surplus at the right. beginning. Then well, we start subtracting. And, it, yeah. and really it's, it's, it's funny because uh, I love that approach because it's not a uh, takeaway. It's an ad. And uh, like one of the easiest things you could do is you could tell someone, okay, first thing we're going to do with your diet I'm not going to tell you to cut anything out, but you. I want you to eat three servings of leafy green vegetables every day. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. And just naturally just, see what happens. Yeah, yeah, and just see what happens. Try now, and fit the rest of the shit in with that. Right. Now, the, exactly. The first thing that's going to happen is uh, when they add those three veg- those three servings of vegetables is they're going to feel good because now they've got all these nutrients they didn't have before and all this fiber. The second thing that's going to happen is when they know that they need to eat those, they tend to prioritize them. So, oh, okay, coach says I need to eat three servings of vegetables, so I'm going to start you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner with these vegetables, you're probably going to eat less of the other stuff as well as a result. But even if you don't do that, it's easier to add than it is to take away, and that's a good starting point. But I guess the short answer to this is slow. Go slow. Take your time. Do one thing at a time. It is a lifestyle change. Speed up your metabolism before you decide to cut calories. Get stronger. Make the cornerstone of of your routine around strength. Um, And as far as nutrition is concerned... You know, one step at a time because you want to lose it once. That's what I always tell my clients. How many times do you want to lose this weight? And they always answer the, just one time. Say, okay, then let's do it the right way because otherwise you're going to be losing it for the rest mm. of your life. Hmm. All right. Next up is Fit M28. Is it true that you need to warm up your body with cardio before lifting? Ooh. That's funny. Ooh. Warm this up is, for what? You know, know what? What's the difference? Yeah. Let's talk this, about warming up. Well, this so is what blood flow motivated. If you've been around for a long time, this was kind of a popular question a long time ago. And almost everything, well, actually everything that we've created was a response to uh, the audience, right? We get a lot mm-hmm. of people that asked about CrossFit and that if, what if I like that way of training? So outcomes, performance, a lot of people that love bodybuilding and we're like, okay, well, how would you do it? Okay, well, here comes Maps Black. Well, a lot of people know that, okay, I've been told that warming up the body and getting ready to where I've heard that's so important. Is it best to just get on and do cardio? And uh, this is what really inspired Maps Prime. Yeah, you see, I mean, you still see a lot of programs that will just have you run laps and all that stuff just to get the body sort of moving and get... Uh, you know, blood flow and get heart rate up uh, to a certain degree. But uh, that's really the extent of what has been in our uh, mm-hmm. industry is is uh, being uh, sort of, uh, you know, sent out is like that's, you know, it's important, but th- that's as much thought process mm-hmm. that's gone into it. So with warming up, the concept of warming up and the idea behind it, even if you ask people today, you say, okay, why do you warm up? What's important about a warm up? And everybody's going to answer the same way. Most people will. It's to prevent injury which I think is hilarious, okay? It'd be like me uh, buying a car and the most, the only thing I'm looking at is, is this car going to explode? No, cool, I got it. I want to get the car that doesn't explode. The very least that a warm-up should do for your body is prevent injury. That's the least. It better fucking do that. But there's a lot more that a warm-up can do, a lot more. 
it can actually take your workout, if you do it right, whatever your workout is, if you go to the gym and you're doing squats and overhead presses and you know, uh, some, you know, farmer walks and you're going to supercharge it. You're, you're going to maximize that workout by priming your body to fire its muscles in the right order and the right, the right way to send the right signal that you're trying to send when you're building, uh, when you're working out to give you to, so that you can jump into your workout and create the bet, the best recruitment patterns that you can create. There's so much that a warm up can do that is beyond preventing injury that's like the absolute minimum it's the, it's the difference and i was trying to find your analogy there i got a better one it's like it's like going to play around to golf what does everybody do before they play around to golf you get there a half hour to an hour early you go through the mechanics you go everything. through all the mechanics yeah. you you do you drive you know you go hit we normally hit about 100 balls mm-hmm. and then we go putt another 50 or so and if and, you're good you, you also get in the wedge you right, get in the putting right. you get all that yeah, yeah right so and then you go out and then you play around now can you go play around and not do that? Yeah, sure. absolutely. Do you think you're going to make a play a lot better if you go and actually prime the mechanics of the actual what movement? Well, you're going you to know be doing? why? Yeah, because I mean that's looked at as a skill, right? Like golf is is already thought of as like this is like a very like very specialized skill, which blows my mind. We don't look at we exercise. don't look at exercise like that at right. all. And anybody who's ever performed a deadlift, an overhead press, a squat, these movements are a fucking skill. It's the reason why most people, for the very first time, cannot just get under a bar and perform it correctly because it's a skill. And when you start to treat it like a skill, it will actually give you more back in return. Mm -hmm. If you just treat it as exercise and this is just moving and burning calories, too many people think of weightlifting like moving around and just burning like if that's all that if that's all you're using exercise for then we'll quit wasting your time with a gym membership just go run around and wave your arms and flap it around and jump up and down and just move for an hour and you're right that will burn calories and that's one way i guess of exercising but if you're going to go lift weights you want to treat it like a skill and you want to get really good at it because the better you get at it the more return you're going to get from it, the more muscle you will build, the more fat you will, and then the less course, time it takes to the, get there. Right? And like Sal said, the least thing that you're going to get from the by, the byproduct is you won't get injured, right? right? So that's like that's like a duh from it. So let me give you a good example of what a and this is a very specific one of what a good warm up or as we we call it priming session would look like for someone who is um, going to go do uh, work out their chest. Let's say someone's going to work out their chest and they've got really bad forward shoulder. Well, let's not even say really bad forward shoulder. Let's just tell everybody that almost everybody, okay, we're talking 80 plus percent of the human population have upper cross syndrome. Right. So you've got bad forward shoulder. Everybody. So the way I may prime myself or this person before a bench press or whatever is I'll make sure that the muscles that stabilize the shoulder region that stabilize the scapula, that retract them and depress them, that's pull them back and down, um, are active. They're activated and they're ready to fire. I'll also make sure that this individual, uh, if they have tight pecs, that we've loosened them up a little bit. Now, I'm not going to statically stretch them, but I may do some dynamic stretches for the chest so we can get a good full range of motion so it doesn't pull the the shoulders forward even further and cause problems in those shoulders. Same thing with uh, if I have a client who's going to go do squats and let's say she just she, her glutes just don't fire. Well, yeah, before but let's, that let's, workout, let's, I'll stick, let's stick to the chest like you're saying and keep going this direction and deeper and why this is so important. So Sal's addressing upper cross syndrome, which is the rounded shoulders and the forward head that everybody pretty much suffers from. It's just a matter of how much you suffer from it. So if you don't warm up properly or prime the body, you get under. Sure, you can bench press. But when you do bench press, your deltoids, so your shoulders and your triceps are probably taking over yeah, a little bit more. They're way too dominant. They're taking, and those that are listening to this right now, this is you. If you're somebody who bench presses and you're like, man, I just never really feel it in my chest or my chest never really gets sore, but you're, you feel you're it. You're not your, fully retracted. Probably. Right. You feel it in your arms. Yeah. This is why it's because if you just do a movement, even if it looks like the movement is proper, but you have your body is out of position mechanically, then what ends up happening is the secondary muscles take over, carry the load, and you're not activating the prime mover. Right. And sometimes, I mean, this does need corrective work and it's going to take an X, you know, amount of time to really like uh, solidify that position, even to, to sustain it for an amount of time. But, you know, once you get to that point, 
now you have to like coach your body consistently. Like here's the position that's ideal. Here's the the here's what I want out of this. And so that's where the prime, the warm up comes into play where we need to to reiterate that point to your body and to, you know, your command center to to operate that way going into the lift. Right. I, and I, I want to add something because you said like if you don't feel it in your chest, you, you may feel it. You may even feel it in your right, chest. Right, right, you're right. You may get sore in your chest, but you you also may be creating a pattern in your upper body or enforcing a pattern that is not optimal that will that will promote injury and problems in the future and that that goes back to like the golf swing analogy you could still hit the ball just because you're hitting the ball and it's going in front of you doesn't necessarily you're hitting the ball correctly like you once you and you could be creating bad habits bad patterns anybody that understands golf knows this knows that if you have this this awful swing just because you're hitting the ball doesn't necessarily mean you're hitting the ball optimally and eventually that catches up to you it will keep you from going to the next level in that sport well the same thing goes for exercise yes you can get through the exercises yes you could feel it in your chest but if you want the optimal or the most ideal results from that movement than learning how to do it mechanically. And so this was the real magic behind Prime is that we in within Prime, there is an at-home test that each person takes and it will definitely tell you what areas you need the most work put in before you go to work out so that you get the best out of all of your exercises. So it's very individualized. It's not like, oh, here's the movements because we've had mm-hmm. people ask us for. Well, it has me- to be individualized. Yes. Yeah. Uh, your priming session or your warm-up should be based on your individual body. Um, uh, that's it. I mean, it has to be based on your individual body because what Adam may do with his priming session before his workout may be perfect for him, but it may be the exact opposite of what Justin needs to do yeah. before his workout. Well, we all have different limb lengths. We all have different variables. You know, we all, we've all like had different sleeping patterns, different imbal- you know, different uh, stress, like. It, there's just like way too many factors that people have to realize. It's so individualized. That's what that's the difficulty uh, we face as, as trainers and coaches that we're trying to tackle this. But how do we tackle this and make it simple? That was our best answer to it, and right. that's that's literally like what we came up with. That um, seems to be working very well if you put the effort into it. You have to learn this yourself. I'll I'll, I'll end it with this: uh, priming or warming up should be part of your workout every single time. It should not be a disposable part of your workout. It's just as important as the workout. Next question is from Deller Zach 2 Your thoughts on how low-calorie healthy foods like Halo Top affect a person's relationship with food? Uh, oh, this, this is a good is, question. This is a good question. This reminds me of that uh, conversation people? we yeah. had with the No the, Foods the guy. No Foods guy. Right. So mm-hmm. so he this person is referring to and he put healthy in quotes. Uh, you know, foods that are in that health market, but that are designed and engineered to taste Tastes really like good. Food. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, you know, if you like pizza, try our pizza, which tastes the same, but it's got you know less calories, less carbs, less fat, whatever. Or, you know, try Halo Type ice cream because uh, it's got less calorie, less sugar. There's than really stuff. two two different positions that De- we can take on this. They're, well, I think they're both valid. Right. I think there's two positions that are very valid. Yeah. Are they? better options than their unhealthy counterparts and I'm, I'm could I'm, be and i'm being general here because yeah. there's some of these these quote-unquote healthy foods which are worse depending on where your awareness is and your psychology yeah. right like you could be like diet coke is better than regular coke eh, maybe maybe not depending right. on the context um but let's say something genuinely is made with decent ingredients and it just tastes really good um is it a better alternative in the short term i think it is obviously if you're eating you know, uh, regular ice cream, and then you go to another type of ice cream that's, you know, still, it's got healthier ingredients, lower calories and stuff like that. It could be good, but it could also be bad because it doesn't handle the root of what's going on where you're seeking out these highly palatable foods for comfort, for stress, or for whatever. The other thing you want to consider is when foods are engineered, to be super, super, super palatable or super tasty. Makes it really easy to become addicted to them. <laughs> and you overeat. You, you know, you'll tend to overeat them. I mean, I would over, I'd, I'd get protein bars that taste super good and I'd eat a fuck ton of them <laughs> and because they're protein bars, right? Well, yeah. this was the debate that I kind of got into it with this guy who is, you know, building a very large company that is targeting this market. So I said, well, here's the problem I have with these quote unquote healthy foods 
is because they're lower calorie and considered healthy, I tend to justify eating them more often. And in reality, none of them are really that beneficial for my body. So that's, and that's the attitude you got to kind of look at is like, yeah, man, Halo. I mean, if you were, if I had, if it just happened to be Friday night and Katrina and I are sitting down to watch a movie and I'm just like, I've been really dialed in on my diet. I'm like, you know what, man, I just, I just want that, that taste of ice cream. I haven't had in a long time. Either one, I'll go get all the diarrhea. uh, Yeah. Either one, I'll go get. (laughs) the uh you know frozen yogurt version of whatever flavor i'm feeling like or maybe i did something like halo and then that i have it that night and then i feel like i satisfy the quote unquote craving that i'm having at the time and then i move along my day and go on but what i've seen at, at least in the the bodybuilding world since i'm very familiar with the people that are promoting these types of foods is they get refrigerators full of this stuff and then it becomes a very regular thing yeah. in their diet because they're still not addressing the addiction issue that they have for this this food because it's a Yeah, like, you can abuse these foods just like you can abuse any other food. Right. You know, and, you can treat and, them just like And a arguably it's easier to because it's they're justified. because they yeah, one, it's justified, and then two, they're engineered. Yeah. For you to become you still addicted have the to cravings it. attached to it, right? Yeah, that, right. That hasn't even been addressed. And really, there's, there's. So when you look at this healthy food category, you have the highly engineered, super processed, you know, healthy food stuff, and then you have healthy foods that are just alternatives that are not in that same category. For example, you may like pasta. Well, maybe I'll, I'll have some. Uh, what is it when they, when you, it's the spaghetti squash. Maybe I'll do spaghetti squash and then put sauce in that. That, that to instead. me is a much better. Yeah. Now it's it's not it doesn't taste like pasta, right? But it's 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 healthy. It's lower calorie. Uh, it may it's be real, better. It's real food. It's real food. It, food. It may be better for me. So because a lot of these healthy foods tend to be, you know, low sugar, right? Low, like low carbohydrate, low sugar, or low fat, or whatever. But then in order to make them taste the way they do, they pack them full of chemicals and stuff. You know, like how do you how do you get something low fat that gives you that same mouthfeel? Well, they may need to put some kind of synthetic chemicals or whatever to give you the same mouthfeel. Or how do I get something sweet without putting sugar in it because I'm trying to make a product that's low sugar? Well, let's use aspartame or sucralose. So that's the other thing you want to be careful for. And lastly, the when we engineer foods to uh, taste in the you know in these highly palatable ways that with these combinations of tastes and flavors and colors that we would never encounter in nature. Your brain is still perceiving these tastes and there's still something going on. So if I taste something that even has no calories in it, but is super sweet and tasty, I'm still sending a signal to my brain that says super sweet and tasty. And I may still have similar effects in terms of the neurochemicals and the emotional connections to these types of foods. So I do think they're a stepping stone. I do too. I just don't think it's a place that you that's stay. How, that's how I look at it is it's like a stepping stone because if you – the argument to promote something like this, and I can get behind this, is let's say someone like me who uh, was very much so addicted to ice cream for many, many years. Uh, I had a Ben & Jerry's or the Safeway brand or whatever of the like, fucking pint of ice cream every single night of my life. Like every single night of my life. You ate a whole? Damn. Yeah. Yeah. Every night. The pint is this you one, right? Yeah, yeah. Well it's like too. 1,500 yeah. calories, 1,500 to 2,000 calories of ice cream. Every single night. Every single night. What was your flavor? Oh, man. I ate it all, dude. Ooh. Uh, mint chip. Mint Half chip. baked. Yeah. Mint chip and no, uh, chocolate bomb. chip. I'm pretty basic when it comes to my favorite flavors, but I'll have everything. I mean, so. And would you just sit down in front of the TV and just crush yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. No, it was yeah. very much so a, a, oh, wow. a routine of my life where I had. I And again. How did you break that? <laughs> So it's th- doing it that long. So that's this is a really good question, and this is why I can get behind this, and I could still argue and debate the positive side of this. I did start. I had Halo. I definitely have had this. So you went from regular to Halo, right? Or frozen yogurt, or oh, so, another a, another option first. I actually went from ice cream to gelato, to uh, frozen yogurt to Halo to coconut wh- cocoa whip to not really needing it at all. Mm. And it was all, it, and we're talking about a long process here for me. So we're talking about somebody who had ice cream every single day of his life for probably ten plus years, and that's not exaggeration for those that are wondering. Like that's, I I couldn't gain weight my whole life. Like I just, and so two thousand calories of ice cream was no fucking big deal. If anything, you were like, this is awesome. Right. Yeah. I need more calories. I'll just eat ice cream. Right. Right. Totally. So this is definitely something that um, I had to later on. 
learn to change as far as a habit. And these types of foods did help it. But I remembered that, and this I think that's the 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 true takeaway from this is that totally, I, I mean, I think all of our thoughts on this, I think it's a better choice than that. But don't stop there. Don't stop there. It's just still not the most ideal thing that my body could have right now. And you need to be, you need to understand that. You need to understand that I'm really not serving my body by eating this every single night. It's like the methadone of foods. Right. God, right. What a great, it's exactly what it is. Yeah. Like you're, you're replacing one thing for another. Um, so be careful of that. It, it, like Adam was saying, I think as a stepping stone is, is perfectly fine. But if you're not addressing the root of what's going on, then you're never going to really solve anything. Um, and you may get stuck in here if you're lucky, uh, but most people end up doing this. Most people will replace their ice cream with Halo Top or whatever, and then they'll just go back to ice cream after after a yeah. little while yeah. because yeah. it still does yeah, taste, it tastes like shit. And, it still does taste and better. And then the, the, well, my ben and Jerry's. the real the real scary part is, and for me, like what became my concern later on was, you know, here I've got my Halo Top, then I have my, you know, my protein bar, my Your shake, skinny, uh, my Diet Coke, yeah. and then my my sweetener skinny inside my coffee. Then I started like really evaluating my day and being like, holy shit, like I took in five different things today that were all artificially sweetened. And with what we're seeing with artificial sweeteners, I don't think that's a great idea. Do I think it's going to kill me tomorrow? No, I do not think that. Do I think that it's such a that it's such a big deal that I need to be freaking no but I should be fucking aware I should be aware enough to realize that that is probably not ideal for me it, it's probably not putting myself in the best position I can and start to pay attention to that stuff and eliminate it where I can and get better at it so I think like Sal said it's a great stepping stone in the right direction um, and I and I totally think it's fine for somebody to utilize but again I see what I see on Instagram which drives me crazy is those pages where people are you know, every other fucking post is a halo top with their what's that Walden's Walden's fake chocolate syrup oh and their, the yeah. Walden's fake the skinny cream. cow. Uh, yeah. Ice cream. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, you're trying to lose weight, but you're also trying to be healthy. So, you know, consider that. And, you know, <clears throat> and this is going to go this is down the line. So I'm going to go like like uh, kind of when you get down the line of, uh, you know, working on your nutrition and your fitness and you're moving down the down the list. You'll also start to realize that these highly palatable foods just make it harder for you to eat healthy in the sense that when I eat foods that are super tasty because they've been engineered that way, even if they're healthy-ish and they fit you know, with what I'm eating, they tend to make me want to eat more because that's what they do. That's what they're designed for. So at some point, it's way easier for me to eat the amount I'm supposed to eat when I avoid all foods that are or, you know, designed this way, when I cook my foods and when I have you know, things that are natural. It just makes it harder to overeat. So consider that as well. Next up is healthy, happy, and free. Do Can you miss anything about personal training? She does ask, or he, it's a girl, right? I think so. She asks very good questions. Yeah. So yeah. We, tend to, we tend to pick so those. So it happens. Right. Uh, do, so yes, I do. I miss, what I miss most about personal training are the people I used to train. Yeah, the, con I, the conversations. Yeah, it's um, I had when I left uh, or when I sold my studio and then we did this full time, the clients that I had uh, with me who, I don't know how many clients I had, probably around 20, they, um, they had all been with me for an average of, if you took them all and just averaged it out, six or seven years. Some of them were with me for 12 years where they came in the same time, same time during the week every week for 12 years consistently. Like I saw these people and it was a dedicated hour of spending time with that person. I don't spend a dedicated hour with a lot of people that I know in my life yeah. like I did with some of these people um, on a weekly basis. So you develop these relationships with people and I miss them. I definitely do. Now the good thing is uh, my girlfriend trains a lot of them now and uh, they're still, my old studio still there. So if I want, I can pop in and I have a couple times and said hi to people, but I really miss that. I really miss that time where, you know, we're working out together, we're connecting, we're talking about issues, whatever. I miss learning from them. Uh, I learned so much from the people that I trained, uh, everything from professionally, you know, I had clients that were extremely successful, so they would teach me things to, uh, you know, stuff about the human body. I would train doctors and surgeons. And I'd learn about medicine. I'd ask them questions all the time. They love talking about it. Two life lessons. You know, one of my, uh, the oldest client I had or the one that stayed with me the longest, her name is Carol. 
Um, she, uh, she was, you know, she's in her seventies and, you know, if I had questions about raising my kids or I needed advice on relationships or whatever, like she was just an excellent person to talk to and ask questions and she would give me great feedback and I really respected it. So uh, Mm -hmm. nothing, I don't miss anything more than the actual people themselves. I think, yeah, I would definitely agree with all of that. I mean, that's the first thing I think about is all the conversations, the deep conversations, just the life you experience together. Like I've had clients where, I mean, uh, they can remember when I was single, I was coming back from uh, Chicago and, you know, the first time I met Courtney, who became my wife, they went to uh, grad school. Then after that, they actually got their PhD, you know, like things like that, where it's like, we did a lot of like monumental milestones in life. Like, you grow together. together. And, you know, and it's crazy. It's, it's, it's a really deep, like really cool, intimate thing that, uh, you know, is work on, on top of that, which is interesting. But, um, you know, for me, just like looking at it, like, you know, besides all that and looking at it just as a job, like what I do miss about it is, um, like it, it was simple. Like it became to a point where like, I, I like I, I see them and I'm like, cool, I get to like, you know, structure this, this around what I know they're capable of and kind of challenge them a little bit. But like, that was the extent there wasn't all this extra, um, noise. Yeah. Just this uncertainty, you know, like all these different like projects and things and like bombardment of, um, you know, where we're at today, which is also really cool, but it's totally different. Right. Yeah. So like bef- it was more simple then, which made like going home a little bit easier <clears throat> and like being able to be present a lot easier mm-hmm. um, to where now, like I think being present, I feel like I'm kind of riding this this crazy like storm where it's not even a storm. It's just like a <laughs> like I feel like lost sometimes, like walking down this huge woods somewhere, you know, like where do I go? <laughs> where am I today? It like, definitely changed. Holy shit. Our business now definitely changes so much uh, month to month. Whereas when you're training people, it, a lot of things don't change. No, uh, I uh, I don't miss anything about really? a person. No, not at all. Not even the slightest bit. And I'll tell you why. Because the two main things that I absolutely loved about personal training, which is very similar to what you guys were saying. I love the growth that I got because of the people that I was in. Great to train these CEOs and psychologists, therapists and doctors and lawyers. And just, man, it was like just this plethora of knowledge that I would get every single day talking to these great minds and getting to know them and building relationships. And then the other piece that I just fucking loved was changing someone's life, was to make an impact on them that forever changed changed them. Like that was so rewarding. But I tell you, this business shits on those two things. <laughs> it shits on it. Like, yeah. Well, if the, you had to this, compare the two, we're well, obviously here. Well, yeah, exactly. Well, we here's, that decision. here's the thing. Like, the, the, if, you, if we look at just those two things for me that, that motivated me and excited me, the growth, right, the amount of knowledge that I would – this weekend – just the people that I was around and the people I got to, to converse with and mingle with and build relationships with, it was was more information, more knowledge, more growth packed in that weekend yeah. than a year's worth of personal training clients. It's like super speed. Right. And then every time we turn these this, these mics on, you know, I have, I have right now, and I apologize for those that have left me DMs in my on my Instagram or emails. That I mean, I can't even get to all the people that are just thanking us for the information and how much we've impacted and changed their lives. So, uh, the level of rewarding, uh, how rewarding it is because of how many people we're impacting and changing. Again, shits on personal training. Uh, just it can't. I couldn't touch as many people as we're touching right now. Yeah. So I don't. There's not a day that goes by that I go like, man. I kind of miss the good old days where I used to get up at five o'clock in the morning and train eight people and then take a little hour nap and come back and train another four or five people. Like right. there is, what, what about the, I, I what that. about the clients? Like the people you made contact with? Well, you miss, do you ever miss them? I, I still stay in contact with yeah. them. I mean, I, I pride myself on being the relationship guy. I, I, I stay in touch and touch a lot of lives and people that I've been around and I, and I try and, cause I think that's the big, that's the big one, right? Is that you, you train yeah. these people for so long and then you don't see them as much or, well, yeah. Even if you're in contact with them, it's still not the. I mean, it's but even hard. even them, like so, I I probably talk more to the leaders that I develop that are out there touching the lives of clients more than I actually talk to the clients because I get again I get selfishly I get more out of that personally I I like I'll still meet a trainer that I hired 15 years ago 
and is still in the industry and running his own business or has his own gym and I'll meet and have lunch with him or her and sit down and spend a couple hours of just catching up and giving advice and just be, been in their ear and letting them bend mine. And I, I love that. And I still get to feel, feel that, that desire and need that I had for when I back in the training days. So yeah, man, I don't, I don't miss it at all in the slightest bit. And I fucking love what <laughs> I, we're doing. Now. I had a few clients that, um, you know, I trained uh, where I trained them before they got married then they got married. Then they got pregnant, mm-hmm. and then they had the baby. Then they would come into the gym. I actually had three clients like this. Mm-hmm. They'd come into the gym with the baby, and I would hold their baby while they would do sets because yeah. I used to tell because I own the place, right? So I used to tell them because they'd be like, "Oh, I don't know if I can keep coming in because I have the baby." And I'd be like, "Bring the baby here, and it's a private studio, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen." Times. Totally. And I, you guys know me; I love kids. So if you're going to bring a kid in my gym, a baby, you've basically got the best personal trainer slash babysitter combo on the, on the planet. So I'd play with the kids. I'd set up obstacles for the kids while they'd work out or if they were real young. You know, uh, my client Dawn, who I worked with years ago, her daughter Kenzie, she would sit in her little carrier and she'd cry and I'd swing her or I'd feed her while she was working out. And I, I, I do miss the kids because, you know, I'm in contact with them and I ran into them the other day. I actually ran into Don and Kenzie the other day, and she's so big now. And kids, you know, kids change so quickly. Yeah. And it got me a little emotional because I saw her, and I'm like, man, I haven't seen you in a couple years, and you've changed <laughs> so much in a couple years. Like, look yeah, how dude. tall you are. And, yeah. and I told her, I'm like, I used to swing you in the carrier when your mom was working out and feed you and all that stuff. And, you know, would I go back to it? No. It's just nostalgia, I mean, I, though. I, yes. You know what I mean? It's like, just, And that's how I feel, too. It's like, like I said, just when you trace it back to, like, all the life you spent with these people, it's like... You know, it's it, it. You know, it is like it's it's something that you reflect on with um, good feelings, but at the same time, like I get where Adam's coming from. Like oh, I, yeah. I don't, <clears throat> I don't like look at ah oh, man, like you know things were simple and life was like. I am a growth person. Like I like that. I was always seeking that. Even when I was training people, I was thinking about like uh, projects or these other ideas I had that I always wanted to pursue. And it's like now we're in a position where we're pursuing it, mm-hmm. and it's and it's like it's going to kind of level out to a point where we have the systems like solidified, and I won't feel so like I'm running around like aimlessly. Um, which I'm really excited about. Then, that's, we'll that's, another, then we'll have another project. Yeah, yeah, we will. <laughs> I'll, I'll add on a fire to that for sure. Yeah. Do you? Uh, did you guys towards the end of your careers? Be honest, because I'll, I'll tell you straight up. Uh, the last, I don't know, few years of training people and owning my studio, I, got, I was really bored. Well, totally. I, I was. It was, and I it was. It, it was. I was dead inside. I was un. <laughs> I was unstimulated for a long time leading up to it because. Yeah. You know, and there's only so much you can do within it. Yeah. But man, the last couple of years were straight up like because you already had I like one foot out. I didn't hate it because I love the clients, so we they'd come in and be like, "Hey, what's up, John? Whatever." But it was so fucking boring. Yeah, for me at, at, towards the la- towards the end there that I know I wasn't as good of a trainer as I could have been. Totally, because I was just so unstimulated. I'm. I only truly lasted twenty months. Twenty months in the position of training clients, and I was over it. I was already over. Uh, being a a slave to everybody else's schedule. And I'd already felt like I had got the great like excitement of what it was like to change a life and help people that I had already moved on to developing other leaders. Like uh, that really motivated me more. Like that, if someone asked me that question, if there's anything I miss that that's connected to what I used to do was the other leaders like that. I loved, I love to take, other guys and girls that you knew were going to go on to lead, you know, potentially hundreds, maybe even thousands of people one day and know that I had a, a, the ability to impact them for the good. That yeah. to me. And That's now really that that opportunity is presenting itself again right. with our train the trainers and really diving into that. Or even just business. as our staff grows. Yeah, you know? or staff, yeah, all that. But yeah. there, there's, there's all that is going to come back, which yeah. is great. I yeah. love that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Check it out. Go to YouTube. Subscribe to Mind Pump TV. We post a new video every single day. In fact, the one we posted today is crazy. Go check it out before they take it down. Also, 30 days of coaching fire. for free. Available at mindpumpmedia.com. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, 
and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. Mind Pump.